Our next presenter is Dr. Sandra Schneider. Sandra M. Schneider is currently the Senior Vice President for Clinical Affairs at the American College of Emergency Physicians and Adjunct Professor of Emergency Medicine at the University of Pittsburgh. Prior to moving to Texas, where she now serves as an emergency medicine physician with the JPS Health Network in Fort Worth, she was the Professor of Emergency Medicine at Hofstra Northwell School of Medicine and Senior Research Director for the North Shore LIJ Department of Emergency Medicine. She was the founding chair of the Department of Emergency Medicine, Professor of Emergency Medicine at the University of Rochester. Dr. Schneider is the past president of the American College of Emergency Physicians, the Society for Academic Emergency Medicine, and the Association of Academic Chairs of Emergency Medicine. She is also the past chair of the Residency Review Committee for Emergency Medicine and past chair of the Emergency Medicine Foundation. She is the author of over 100 peer-reviewed manuscripts, as well as multiple other articles and chapters. She has won multiple awards, including the Leadership Award from the Society of Academic Emergency Medicine and the Wigenstein Award from the American College of Emergency Physicians. She is a graduate of the University of Pittsburgh School of Medicine and board certified in internal medicine and emergency medicine. It is with extreme pleasure we welcome Dr. Sandra Schneider. Hey, thank you. Uh, wow, that's a mouthful. Uh, I, I'm sitting there going, holy crap, did I write all that stuff? Uh, I guess so. So uh, hopefully you can see my slides. So th this talk actually came out of a discussion we were having uh, among a bunch of emergency physicians and some people from the ADA. And it really has two parts. It's we're talking a little bit about the patients that we share, these patients that we see in the emergency department and send to you guys and the patients that you guys send, see in your offices and send to us. Uh, and the fact that we really don't talk a lot about those shared patients. And there are two reasons to talk about them. One is just what um, we know as emergency physicians and what we don't know. And then what dentists know about their patients and what they don't know. And so we came out and decided we would talk to each other uh, about these patients. So to give each other uh, a viewpoint from where we were standing and then also come back and talk about what we wish the other group knew. And so uh, this is part of part two of a two-part group. We've already had dental 101 or what the dentists wish the emergency physicians knew. And this is really uh, emergency, what happened there? Hang on, I don't want, it doesn't want to click, hang on. This is uh, what, uh, dent what we wish dentists would know, or this is emergency medicine 101. So let me tell you a little bit about myself. I've been an emergency doc for over 40 years. I practiced in rural Kentucky. I practiced in suburban areas. I practiced in urban areas in four different states and 10 different hospitals. But one thing has remained the same. No matter where I worked, I always saw at least one patient with dental disease. And what you also need to know about me and almost every other emergency physician is we get a couple of hours of education in medical school, sort of like this is a tooth, this is the tongue, this is the gum, okay, next. And emergency residents who actually are seeing a lot of these patients may spend a couple of weeks in the dental clinic, but most can't read a Panorex and certainly can't read one of those itty bitty little x-rays that you guys use. And we certainly can't identify an abscess. And then to make matters worth, Worse, in almost half the places I've worked and probably across the country, there is no access to dental x-rays or, or Panorex. And all we have is this like really expensive CT. And so we end up doing a CT scan to find out the patient has a dental carry. In other words, we don't know a lot about dental medicine and we need to know more. But what's also very important is to remind you that in 40 years of practice, I cannot remember a single shift in which I didn't see a patient with a dental complaint. And this is borne out by the facts that over 2 million visits are made to emergency departments every year to see a patient, to see a doctor that doesn't really know what they're doing. And among the most preventable visits to the emergency department 
in, in almost every kind of way you look at it. Dental pain, non-traumatic dental visits are the number one preventable emergency department visit. And what, again, I wanna emphasize what makes this worse is not only is it preventable, but when they come, we really don't know what to do with them. So why do they come? They come for three, again, these are non-traumatic, okay? Because traumatic is very different. Uh, but why do they come and what do they come for? Almost all of them have some form of pain. Uh, some of them will have swelling, facial swelling, and some of them will have bleeding of the gums. But I would say 90% of them have some kind of pain. And what do we end up calling them? Well, when we code the chart, about 20% of them are coded as unspecified disorder of the tooth. Uh, because again, we have a very poor education when it comes to dental issues. Uh, about 25% of them get some kind of a diagnosis of abscess. 25% uh, of them get a diagnosis of dental caries. And quite frankly, 25% of them get a smattering of other diagnoses. Uh, and probably most of them don't have exactly what we write. Because again, we don't really know. And, and I will inform you that the number one thing that the dentist suggested that emergency physicians should know is what is a carry and what is an abscess and what do you do about them? And, and so we did have a really wonderful webinar where we learned these things, uh, probably more than I learned in my residency. But so why do the people come to the emergency department if, you know, if we don't really do much? Well, they do it because they really don't have another access to dental care. In many cases, this is because they don't have insurance, they don't have any coverage, but other patients come because it's the weekend or after hours, they, they know that they're having dental pain and they've got to go to work tomorrow and that's when the dentists are available. And again, with the codes, in reality, we often just make it up. We look in and they, yeah, that looks bad. And we say, well, gee, it's probably an abscess. It might be a carry. Maybe it's an unspecified disorder or the two. So these patients are largely low acuity. Again, this is comparing on this side, the dental visits, and the higher you are on the graph, the less acute your care is. So tw almost 25% of non-traumatic dental visits are uh, low, lowest acuity. Whereas if you look at all the other visits that come in, only about 7% are there. Now there are some people that have very severe disease and Part of the problem is, you know, we have to figure out who has the Ludwigs and who has these uh, significant abscesses. But again, if you look at the people in the, the non-dental category, you'll see that most of them are much higher acuity. And most of them are uninsured. The top, uh, excuse me, the bottom bar is uh, private insurance. And you can see very few people have private insurance. This is private medical insurance, not necessarily dental. And again, the bulk of them are charity or uninsured, about 50% of the ones we see. And one of our problems in the emergency department, speaking very frankly, is that group of patients has nowhere to go. Uh, in, in some places, in many places, there are some kind of programs that have been started, but for most of the places I've worked, they have nowhere to go. And so what do we do with them? Um, well, we give them a lot of antibiotics. Uh, whether they need it or not. Uh, in the past, we gave them a lot of opioids. Uh, now we give them more of the non-steroidals or Tylenol. And, and we do do a fair number of dental blocks. Unfortunately, the dental blocks that we do on Friday don't get them through till Monday. Uh, and so we need something to get them through till then. The cost is enormous. The cost for these patients who you know, get uh, you know, some treatment um, is about two billion a year, and most of it is borne by government. Now, since I'm in Texas now, and since uh, you know this is in Texas, I wanted to show you some data from 2018. There were a hundred over a hundred thousand visits in that year for non-traumatic dental disease for a cost to Texas of two hundred million dollars. Again, most of these were Medicaid, and uh, there were some admissions. Now. The other thing to think about with severe dental disease and admission, there are very few severe dental diseases that require admission that couldn't have been prevented. And so the person who comes in with Ludwig's, uh, which is you know for us a severe, a severe emergency, most likely 
could have been prevented with good dental care prior to that. I mentioned opioids. Uh, we have started, we've really stopped using opioids it, to many, to a large extent in the emergency department, particularly uh, at home opioids. Um, again, you know, we give, used to give out a lot of prescriptions for opioids, but what's important to know is our prescriptions were usually for two to five pills. Um, yet what we know is that even this small number of pills can lead in some patients to long-term use. Um, and so you, you know, if you go to the emergency department with a toothache, and I'm hoping none of you would, uh, you know, you're probably not going to get opioids anymore, whereas five to 10 years ago, you might have. Um, in this particular uh, case, second, um, this is one of the reasons why we have stopped using opioids, and that is that we are in a severe crisis uh, with the opioid epidemic um, and opioid uh, overdose deaths. Uh, and so this is the main reason. Again, emergency physicians give out a, or used to give out a lot of prescriptions for a very small number of pills. Now we give out a very few prescriptions for a very small number of pills, and we are actively working to help these patients. So what can we do about this? Well, I think there really is the need for communication. So when I have a patient um, with appendicitis, usually the surgeon, or I think appendicitis, the surgeon will often call me back and say, hey, that was appendicitis, or hey, that wasn't appendicitis, and we have a dialogue. If I'm sending the patient to them, we have a dialogue. Dentists are different because I never have the dialogue. Um, and so what I'm asking you to do is if you're around a hospital, and most of you are, think about whether or not you could help uh, the emergency physicians in that area in two ways. One, give them some education, um, how to read one of those Panorex things, how to read one of those itty bitty x-rays, what a carry looks like, what an abscess looks like, how do you open an abscess, should you open an abscess? Very simple. I know to you, that's probably like super dental 101, but for us, we don't have that. And then provide some means of referral. If you can take just one patient in your office every week uh, that can't pay, if you can do it once a month, uh, if you can, uh, anything you can do. But the main thing here is talk to the medical director. Because when I talked to a, a group of dentists before, they said, oh, yeah, we talked to one of the nurses in the emergency department. I'm like, yeah, you know, but at, or even if you talk to one of the doctors, what you want to do is talk to the medical director, talk to the nurse manager. They're the bosses. They're the ones that make things happen. Make an appointment, go in, talk to them, say, what can I do? Are you having a problem? Is there something we can do? because this is costing a lot of money and worse yet, patients aren't getting better. And, and that's, I think the bottom line. Okay, so now I wanna change the topic just a little bit. By now, if you don't know um, what this is, you're in big trouble. So when we asked our docs, our emergency docs, what is it you wish the dentist knew? This was obviously high on the list. And by the way, remember this is not, uh, being mean to you. We did the same thing with the dentist had the opportunity to tell us what they wanted us to know. And, and we listened. Actually, we were so excited to get that education. But let's start with COVID because COVID has just topped, turned this world upside down. And I know our previous speakers talked a little bit about this. So this is the number of emergency department visits reported uh, through the CDC in over time. This is starting in January of, um, tw of uh, 2019 and going to uh, May of 2021, 2022, excuse me. Um, what happened is when COVID hit, our visits dropped about 40%. Wow. And it were an emergency department. It wasn't that we were closed, they dropped. We saw a second drop when we had uh, a more Omicron earlier this year. So people are scared to come to our emergency departments. And quite frankly, back in January of 2020, we were kind of scared to work in the emergency department. So what's interesting is what happened to, uh, this is the dental pain patients in 2020. So what happened is we saw a dip 
But we saw a dip primarily because of this sort of uh, height. And initially I said, wow, you know, we saw a dip and it stayed there. But then I went back and looked at 2019 and 2018. And what's interesting is it's not a dip, but this spike in the beginning of the year, which I've never seen reported, uh, is constant for every year. So the first few weeks of January, we see a huge spike in patients coming to the emergency department for dental pain, regardless of the pandemic. And this sort of then just trailed back to being normal. But what was also interesting is this was the EMS calls for patients with dental pain. So these are people who took an ambulance. And again, you'll see a big spike in the beginning of the year and then sort of a falling off and coming back. So they, it's interesting that EMS calls didn't really change that much. So people were still taking ambulances to come in. And then here's the dental pain in children, children less than two, uh, 12. And this spike, this gigantic spike in the beginning of the year is again, consistent year after year after year. I have no explanation for it. Uh, I have some theories. By the way, we also see a spike not like this uh, in, in people with medical diseases coming to the emergency department in the first week of January. So whether it's people holding off over Christmas, whether it's, you know, they've got some new money, I don't know what it is, but this, this spike is just fascinating to me. This is what happened to Medicaid uh, claims for dental services during the pandemic. And you can see that there was, again, that dip that looks very much like the dip we saw in emergency visits. Uh, and then it comes back uh, to a much more normal one. Now, the other thing that we wanted to talk about uh, with COVID is the fact that dentists can help us by being vaccinators. You know, it's it's a yeah, it's a pain. Okay, it's a pain. We we vaccinate in the emergency departments, uh, particularly during COVID. We had, I think, some of you who were from the Dallas Fort Worth area may have remembered that we set set up the Texas Speedway uh, to vaccinate early on. But dentists can be vac can vaccinate, and especially those who work uh, in populations that don't see uh, physicians on a on a reasonable basis. Uh, this may be something you want to consider, despite the fact that you are authorized to give COVID vaccines, very few of you do, um, and mostly it's in the larger groups. There are lots of resources out there for you to learn to be vaccinators, but if you're not vaccinating, and I get it, it's a, it's a pain, at least be a promoter of vaccines, ask your patients, are they vaccinated? And if they're not, if there's something that you can do to change their mind. What we know is there's a group of people who are like, I'm not getting vaccinated no matter what, no matter who, no matter, you know, no, doesn't matter. And there are lost costs. <clears throat> so just put those aside. But there are a lot of people who are like, oh, I haven't gotten around to it. You think it's important? Um, and so, I, and the answer to that is yes. And that's a person that you can help and maybe save a life and certainly save an ED visit. Okay, now for the fun stuff. We sent out a note to our docs and said, what do you want the dentist to know, okay? Just what do you want them to know? And there were a few obvious things. And these, by the way, are pretty much in the uh, order in which they came. So don't give opioids. Opioids are bad. Opioids are bad. Did I tell you opioids were bad? Do something else besides if you, anything you can do besides giving opioids. Again, sometimes you have to, but don't. Give written instructions. You would not believe some of the things we, we hear that not only dentists, but the family doctor told the patient to do. It's crazy. So they clearly, you know, they hear you. They might even repeat it back to you. And then they go home and do something, you know, swallow teaspoon of salt every hour, um, you know, come in if there's any blood on the gauze, um, that type of stuff. So give written instructions because, you know, people, uh, don't listen. Um, and worse yet, they listen to Google, Dr. Google. I'm sure you have problems with Dr. Google as well as me. Uh, and they listen to their neighbor who says, oh, my sister had blood on the gauze after she had an extraction and she died three weeks later. If you're going to send a patient to the emergency department, and we get it, there are issues that you find, 
call the emergency department and leave a number where we can call you back if we have to. Because again, they, we, the patients come in and we say, what's wrong? And they say, my dentist found something and sent me in. Hmm, found something. Any ideas what? Nope. I had a lady once, uh, this came in from a, a physician and she said, I just had, I had an MRI uh, on Friday, this was of course Saturday when the MRI was uh, done. And my doctor called me and said, I have a life-threatening problem. I said, good. Uh, I guess we'll be doing that MRI again because uh, I don't know what a life-threatening problem is uh, from that. And by the way, she didn't know what an M which part of her body she had an MRI in. Okay, so let's, the ones, the other ones we're gonna spend some time on are hypertension, anaphylaxis, lidocaine, a few sentences about uh, acetaminophen and then malignant hyperthermia. This, I can't say enough. I should have put this in gigantic letters. If the patient has no symptoms, it does not matter what the blood pressure is. The highest blood pressure I ever sent home was a 300 over 190, all right? That does not matter what the number is if they don't have symptoms, if they don't have visual symptoms or they're not seizing or they're not, you know, totally mentally confused, it does not matter. It can wait till the next day or even probably the next week. All right, anaphylaxis. By the way, did I say that enough? If it's, there are no symptoms, the blood pressure doesn't matter. You can tell them they need to check with their doctor that it's running high, but it, you don't come to the emergency department. Uh, by the way, my mother uh, had, we, I got a blood pressure cuff when I was a medical student on Christmas day and I took my mother's blood pressure and it was 260 over 160. And we were about to sit down to a ham dinner and I let her sit down to the ham dinner and we had Christmas. And then the next day she went to her doctor. All right, anaphylaxis. All right, anybody can be allergic to anything. And the trouble is they, they don't know they're allergic the first time. So it is important that we all know the symptoms and we all know the treatments of this. And the symptoms you should have been taught, but you know, it's the airway, coughing, wheezing, it's the rash, the hives, the immediate redness that we see, confusion, anxiety. They may be uh, have a thready pulse. Uh, they may have a really high pulse. And the one that we often forget is they may get sudden nausea, vomiting, and even diarrhea. So if you just injected lidocaine and the person suddenly feels like they're gonna throw up and have diarrhea, Think about anaphylaxis because any one of these symptoms can be anaphylaxis. You don't need the whole constellation. And again, it's not the first time that they're, uh, they see this substance, they're, they won't know they're allergic. So again, anyone can be allergic. The treatment is epinephrine. And please, if you don't have an EpiPen in your office, or some epi, you should have some epinephrine, um, this should be something that you treat because the sooner you treat it, the better the patient's going to be. Um, I My husband has an allergy to bee stings. We have about seven of these in the house uh, all over the place and in suitcases and backpacks and my purse. All right, it's very simple. Lidocaine. So lidocaine, you can be allergic to, but more importantly, you can, uh, it's possible to overdose on lidocaine. And I was at the University of Rochester where we actually had a case of a young woman who uh, got an overdose of topical lidocaine when they were trying to do a bronchoscopy. So again, topical gets absorbed. Injected is obviously absorbed. And remember that they, these peaks can be later, which is why this girl went home to her dorm and died. The initial um, symptoms are a feeling of numbness and, and paresthesias and a little bit of confusion. And again, pulses can be high, uh, but the things like chest pain, shortness of breath, and the bad problems like seizures come later. So there is a maximum dose to lidocaine. And yes, it's a problem, but don't go above it. And you, if the patient starts to have numbness of the tongue and you didn't do something that was going to do a numbness of the tongue, then that's a problem. But the, as it goes up, you'll see it's lightheadedness, et cetera. So this is a big problem. And remember, did I tell you topical is the problem? All right. Acetaminophen. Every year I see a patient who overdosed unintentionally on acetaminophen or, or Tylenol. People think because you can buy it over the counter, eh, it's fine. And so they take, you know, two 
regular strength or, or two extra strength, uh, you know, every hour because the first one didn't work. Uh, I know people who were taking this, you know, every hour because they felt bad. It wasn't that they had a headache or they didn't have pain. They just felt tired and, you know, whatever. Um, so please warn them. This is the limit. Okay. 12, eight extra strength, 12 regular, as long as the liver is normal in the patient, if the liver is not normal, that number comes down. Patients with acetaminophen, this is a terrible drug if you overdose on it, because if you take an overdose of it, you might get a little bit, let's say you swallow a whole bottle. Uh, you might get a little bit of a, a GI upset, not much, and then nothing happens. And then two days later, your liver rots out and five or seven days later, you're dead unless you get it. Uh, so this is a, a problem. And so warn them, please don't take too much. And then we're gonna talk just for a second about malignant hyperthermia. This is rare. This is like super rare. I've only seen maybe two cases of this. It's inherited and we now have a test that we can do to know whether or not the person uh, actually has it. So the chances of you seeing it are going down, but any anesthetic, including local anesthetics and lighter, lidocaine can cause this. The patient initially be, gets severe muscle stiffness, uh, later develops fever, later meaning a few minutes to an hour later, and then they can get a really fast heartbeat, palpitations, a heart irregular, and people can die from this, usually because of the fever. But the interesting thing is the muscle stiffness. And where you're going to see it is you say, open the mouth, and they're going to go, <laughs> um, it's really rare. But the one the, of the two cases that I saw in the last decade or two, one came from a dental office with lidocaine. Okay, so we're all totally tired of COVID. I mean, I am just like sick of this disease, even though it's there. And by the way, we're in the middle of a surge, particularly in the DFW area and in the Austin area. So please be careful. Um, if you're tired of COVID, I got a new one for you, monkeypox. And if you haven't heard of this, then you've been under a rock uh, because this has been all over the news because everyone thought this could be the next pandemic. Um, and let me tell you a few facts about this. So it is an orthovirus, okay? It's related to chickenpox, related to smallpox. Chickenpox being a relatively benign disease, smallpox, well, not so much. It is a double-stranded DNA virus, as opposed to the coronavirus, which is an RNA virus. RNA viruses are very unstable. Uh, they mutate very quickly, we sort of figured that out by now. Um, there is a lot of, of mutations. A double-stranded DNA virus is very stable. Um, and there really are two strains of this. And, and although uh, I, I wouldn't be surprised if they come out and say the current monkeypox is going to be either a variant of this other strain or a, um, a new strain exact. The two strains are the Congo strain. This is a severe disease. This is the picture you see of the little uh, kid with like blisters all over his body. Um, these, this is the one that's causing rare, but, but some deaths. And then the West African strain, which seems to be the one that we have, which is much milder. This is transmitted through infected skin from either animal or humans uh, into uh, either in intact skin or a slight uh, abrasion in the skin. We believe, and I'm going to put make a lot of believes because this is a pretty new virus uh, to cause human disease in this form. We believe that it uh, requires fairly close uh, contact um, and for over a prolonged period of time. But this the strain that's in the US and the UK right now does appear to go through broken skin. It does appear to be respiratory transmitted, excuse me, and it does appear to go through mucous membranes. The problem is that, um, you know, we, we don't know a huge amount about this virus and you're gonna see a lot of research being done the way COVID uh, was. The rodent is the animal host and so there's concern that we might get uh, uh, infection in, uh, in an endemic way, if it, it gets into our rodents. So who's at risk? People who travel, uh, particularly who travel to the UK where this is a much bigger problem, uh, certainly if they go to West Africa, uh, if they've been exposed 
And then in the United States, for reasons we don't know uh, a lot about, the vast majority are uh, among men who have sex with men. Now, for your information, not all men who have sex with men are either gay or only have sex with men. Uh, but a lot, of, a fair number of men who have sex with men also have sex with women and are not, do not consider themselves to be gay, uh, maybe bisexual. Uh, so this is the picture that gets everybody freaked out. This kid looks like horrible, right? And the United States is not like that. So the incubation period is seven to 14 days. So a long incubation period. The prodrome uh, lasts for about three, uh, up to five days. It's fever, headache, but most importantly, lymph nodes. Lymph nodes appear to be in almost all the patients, particularly in the neck. The rash appears around one to three days of the fever. It is usually on the face, except in the United States form, uh, in the UK form. The first lesions are almost always on the mouth or tongue. Ergo, am I talking to you? Because you look at a lot of mouths and tongues. The lesions are much smaller um, and they tend to be not as common. So this would be a typical lesion. If you've, any of you had kids with chicken pox, it looks like chicken pox, except it's only maybe four to five lesions, maybe 10 lesions. Plus the lesions in the mouth are more like erosions. Uh, that's one on the tongue or they look like herpes simplex, a patient who has not had herpes before, all right? This person may have three to four little chicken pot-like lesions somewhere else in their body, and that is a really con a real concern for monkeypox. This is what the lesion looks like. They talk about it being umbilicated, so it has this little center thingy on it, uh, but it's got a little bit of redness. It looks like a chicken pot. But again, most of you haven't probably seen chicken pox. This is what it looks like on various skin types and it will eventually scab over. Now the, and, and this is what it looks like. Some of them get a little pustular. The important thing for you is this is transmittable through the skin, through the oral lesion and the scab itself is absolutely loaded with virus. So, you know, somebody picks off the scab uh, and that thing can be just loaded and loaded with virus. So for you, uh, you can swab the area just with a dry swab, um, but be very careful with the skin. Uh, you should wear PPE. You should be wearing it. Anyhow, you should wear gloves. If you're not wearing gloves, I don't want to come to you. Uh, be very careful about waste management. The, the linen is possible to get it from uh, linen and from, for example, uh, from someone sitting in your dental chair, if you didn't wipe it down, it's not going to probably happen. Um, and then sterilize it. If you find this, there is a way to send it. Uh, I'll leave these slides can be distributed, but basically all you need to do is swab the area with a dry swab and put it in a sterile container. It can be any sterile container. I don't know what you guys have. And then please seal it in a bio bag and then seal it in another bio bag and then send it uh, to the CDC don't send the patient to the emergency department unless you can't do this because you just exposed a whole lot of other people. Um, the health department is quite capable of doing this. Yeah, there it is. Again, most of these people are in mild disease. One of the other symptoms that they have is pain. These lesions may be somewhat painful, like a herpes simplex might be, uh, but the other thing is they often, particularly among men who have sex with men, uh, they get a severe proctitis. They have a lot of pain with defecation, um, et cetera. People at high risk are the usual suspects, um, immunocompromised pregnant women. Again, luckily this disease, although it's, it's becoming very widespread in the United States, is seems to be associated primarily in the uh, population of MSMs. Treatment, I just, you know, I need to know this, but there are many treatments uh, also, there are vaccines, and they're now looking at vaccinating the high-risk populations uh, of this. At this point, it's primarily MSMs. It is not healthcare workers, but you may see that. Those of us who uh, have a scar on our arm from a smallpox vaccination appear to have some immunity. 
Uh, and then again, the patient should be told to isolate until all the lesions have resolved and all the scabs have fallen off and to make sure they throw the scabs into a, uh, a, a, a container. They don't just leave them lying around. And again, this is the scar that many of us have. Uh, this is the vaccines that many of us will probably end up getting. But at this point, uh, they are only uh, vaccinating MSMs and people who have had a significant exposure. Uh, ASEP has created what we call a field guide for monkeypox, field guide because it's not really a textbook, it's a lot about how, what to do if you have someone who has a lesion or a possible lesion. And uh, if you just go to ASEP.org and write in monkeypox in, this, in the search area, you'll come up with our field guide. Um, and then we have a bunch of other point of care tools that you might find. So. That is our little journey through uh, dental emergencies, uh, excuse me, emer emergency emergencies for the dental uh, popular uh, dentists. Well, that sounds great. Thank you so much, Dr. Schneider. We'll go ahead and put up, uh, thank you for your time and presenting today. We thoroughly enjoyed it.